this is my favorite to use. It's my favorite to teach. I still think, and I, I've said this on the podcast many times, that if you walk into a commercial gym, I challenge you to find me more than one person in the entire gym doing a, a true controlled four-second eccentric motion, which is basic protocol for hypertrophy. That's not even super slow-mo. That's not even super slow-mo. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's such a great tool to teach because I already think that even some of the most advanced lifters do not utilize a four second eccentric motion on most most exercises it's also the one of all of these i would say that i would even still recommend to a beginner yeah. even though we put this very as a, safe good definitely point. the safer one even always. though we put this as advanced techniques and it is because there's other you know basics and fundamentals that even a beginner should be doing before they even need to do this but i find this as a great tool even for beginners as a great way to increase intensity without loading the bar more one of the most challenging things to do in fitness is to continue progressing when you're already advanced. Well, in today's episode, we're going to talk about some advanced training techniques that can take your body to the next level. I'm excited for this one because I don't know if, how often you guys get a chance to look at comments on YouTube. And there's one in particular that we get uh, kind of often that it bothers me. And that is that there's this... Uh, this presumption and it's always somebody that probably doesn't listen to the show consistently mm -hmm. that will comment on youtube that like oh yeah yeah they're cool but they're they're for beginners <laughs> yeah. you see that one <laughs> yeah you see that we yeah. get that quite a bit like like the the content that we provide is for beginners well let's be well, honest we talk a lot to the everyday average person for sure I and mean, that's our mission because those are the people that need the most help but we're not beginners yeah right so and i think that that's the part of the thing where i find it a little insulting is because by any means i don't think any of you would consider yourself a beginner lifter no and i think that we should share a lot of our mistakes along the way and our, our personal journeys. And I think that there's a lot of people that I would consider advanced, super advanced, that could learn a lot from some of the things that we share that we learned along the way. Totally. And also, um, I think too much emphasis is put on advanced training techniques That's right. uh, in the fitness space because the confusion is, well, if that's an advanced technique, then that means it's going to make me progress faster. Yeah. No. It's, it needs to be appropriate for your body. So what, who are advanced techniques appropriate for? Well, people who are advanced. Have you been consistent for multiple years? Are you fit? Uh, do you eat right? Do you, are you kind of hitting all the, you know, all the checkpoints and been doing so consistently? That's when some of the stuff makes sense. This doesn't, what we're about to say, I would never apply to somebody who hasn't been working out for at least a year or two consistent you know, week in and week out, who doesn't have a good diet, who doesn't sleep well, um, I would never apply these because not only would they be inappropriate, but they would actually set someone back. But if you are advanced and you are doing those things, then these techniques can become quite valuable. Well, that's why I really like this too, because you've listed 11 of these techniques that I know we have been asked uh, about individually before. Yes. Oh, what do you think about this? Yeah. Oh, what do you think about that? And maybe because we haven't dedicated a whole episode to one of these one of these one techniques. And normally the follow-up question is we start, instead of telling them what we think about this one specific technique, we go, well, what have you been doing? How long have you been training? What is your diet? We start yeah. asking all the other big rock questions that are going to help that person more than this one advanced technique that they're curious about because they probably saw some other YouTube person or social media person mm -hmm. posting about how beneficial it is when in reality, uh, all of these techniques that we're going to go over, I would still, uh, I would still consider them even as, as awesome and great. All of them are is, is so small in comparison to the, the big things that we continue to take talk about. And I think that's where we get this rap of we're for beginners when it's like, you know, how many, like long time lifters need to hear that message. Yes. Yeah. Because, uh, and, and, and by the way, I, I'm just as guilty. Like 10 years into my career, I would consider myself pretty advanced by that time. And I'm still falling into the same trap of doing a lot of these techniques way too much mm -hmm. because, yes. because they're advanced and they're different. Well, this is the stuff that we nerd out on every now and then in our workouts and we experiment with it and we have fun with it because, you know, the, the foundation's already been established over the last few decades. And it's like, um, this is, this is where you get a new stimulus. Like, so I haven't maybe made any progress in a while in my own programming and I want to add something to kind of spice it up. It's great. There's advanced techniques out there that are very valuable for yeah, us. Now, now to be clear, these techniques, you kind of said this a little, Adam. 
These techniques are only going to be effective if you use them judiciously. Yep. These techniques are not effective uh, if you use them regularly. Uh, they will quickly tip your body into overtraining, very quickly uh, result in your body not adapting, but rather just trying to heal all the time. And the reason why I'm saying that is because if you're if you're the appropriate person to apply these techniques, when you do, you will see a spike in progress. You will see strength go up all of a sudden faster than it has been, or muscle go up all of a sudden better, mm -hmm. or you know more so than it has been. And the tendency is to be like, oh my God, keep doing this. Yeah, it gets addictive. Yeah, no. It, it'll work in a short period of time, and then not only will it stop working, but you'll actually start going backwards. So be very careful with using these, or should I say ju judiciously, I think is the, is the best uh, term I can use. Yeah. So the first one, I this is an advanced technique. Now you can program it into workouts where somebody's intermediate and do it very very intelligently. But it's it's somewhat an advanced technique, and I'd say out of all the ones we're going to talk about, this one probably can be used more on a regular now not regular basis, but more on a regular basis than a lot of the other ones, mm -hmm. and that's supersetting. Supersetting refers to just to make it real basic, combining two exercises uh, <clears throat> together in one set. Okay, but there's different ways to use supersets. One way to use a superset is to do what's called a pre-exhaust superset. And a pre-exhaust is where you're trying to exhaust the target muscle with an isolation exercise before moving on to a compound exercise that hits that same muscle. So remember, isolation exercises use a single joint. Compound lifts use more than one joint. Uh, so a good example of a pre-exhaust would be uh, pec deck or cable flies to pre-exhaust the chest, and then you go straight to bench press. The bench press uses now the shoulders and triceps, so you can squeeze out more reps but you pre-exhausted the chest with uh, the flies first. Um, another one would be a compound uh, superset. This is a very basic one where you're just doing two compound lifts. And then the third one is antagonist. You're working opposing muscle groups in a superset. Now, the way I personally like to use this is, and how do I, how do I integrate it into my training, but then also don't uh, overuse it, is I, I like this type of a technique for time. Mm. Um, when you're pairing exercise together, uh, typically the workout is going to be shorter. Uh, you don't need the full 50 minutes cause yep. you're not getting these cause you're getting to some, and, and I would categorize tri sets in here, even though I know you didn't list that off, yeah. um, but three, three exercises. That, yeah. That's right. Supersets and tri sets, um, are techniques that I love to intermittently put into my routine. And instead of like programming it, like, Oh, I haven't done tri sets in a long time or supersets. I'm going to put it in tomorrow. I go, oh, today, and here's a great example. Like by the time we finish this podcast, um, and I have calls, you have calls. I, I'm not going to get a full 50 minute workout in. I'll probably get like more like a 30. I will utilize probably supersets and or trisets in that workout, so I feel like I get a, a good full workout in a in a compressed amount of time. Yeah. So to me. Um, I like doing it like that. Although I know some people program it and it's, and then there's nothing wrong with that. If you're super consistent and you always get an hour in the gym that never gets, and I know you're probably the most consistent with always having an hour. I'm kind of not like that. I'm a little more free flowing with my, my workout time and, and inconsistent when it lands. And I'm like, okay, today's going to be a shorter day. So that's how I'm going to utilize that technique. Well, you talk about like kind of being married to something. This is one of those, I, I believe you introduced me to this. I, and I didn't even really utilize this in my training because I was all so focused on just pure strength, you know, almost five by five type of a uh, protocol where I was like training back in the day. And so I started to get more into hypertrophy, but then like using super setting was just like, man, it, it, it would, it would just pump up my muscles like I had never felt before. So even just feeling the pump was new to me. And so that just became one of those things where I found myself using that for like every workout for like the next like two years. Yeah. And it was just too much and it just lost its effect. Uh, but yeah, it's just one of those, it's, an, it's a new stimulus. It's something that you could totally uh, apply if you're in that kind of situation where you've just been stuck with strength training for a long yeah, time. Yeah, phase three of MAPS Anabolic uses a lot of supersets, mo mainly pre-exhaust supersets. One of my favorites is like a straight arm pull down or a pull over to a pull up or a pull down, crazy lap pump. Um, and then a superset that I use regularly for time is buys and tries. By the end of my workout, typically I'll work my arms and I'm not really, I'm not trying to get my arms any bigger. I like the way my arms look, whatever. So I'm not always focused on, you know, you know, new ways to make them bigger. It's really, it's a time thing, like you said. So I'll go buys, tries, and that just makes the time go by much faster. Yeah. What's up guys and girls and everyone else in between. Here's the giveaway for today's episode. 
MAPS Aesthetic. This is the bodybuilder-inspired, high-volume MAPS workout program. We're going to give it away for free. Here's how you can win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section, and then you can claim your prize, which is free access to MAPS Aesthetic. Also, we're running a sale right now. The RGB bundle is 50% off. That's MAPS Aesthetic, uh, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, all in that particular bundle, plus some more free stuff. So that's 50% off. We also have MAPS Suspension on sale for 50% off. This is a suspension trainer program. So you don't need dumbbells, barbells, machines, cables, bands, nothing else, just a pair of suspension trainers, and you can train your whole body. So if you're interested in that 50% off sale of the RGB bundle or MAPS Suspension, Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and then use the code JULY50, that's JULY50 with no space, for that discount. All right, here comes the show. All right, the next advanced training te technique, which a lot of people do right out the gates, either because they think the harder they work out, the better, or because they heard that they have to train this way in order to get muscles to respond, which is both false, is training to failure, okay? Training to failure means that you lift the weight until you can no longer lift it again with good form. Or some people think it means you literally fail yeah. during the set where you have to drop the weight. That is a, that is a, that's a very, very high intensity technique. If you never train to failure and you're consistent and advanced, you throw in some failure sets here and there, and you will see this really rapid spike in strength. But you continue training to failure and you see that drop way off. So this is one that I abused for a really long yeah, time. Same. Um, and and I think it's because of what we've talked about before, where you change something up and then all of a sudden you see great results from it. I remember when I first started to introduce failure training and I was working out with a workout partner and I did, I saw big strength gains. And so I quickly became married to that technique and it became a staple. It became for years uh, after that, that like every exercise I trained to failure. And I, and there's a lot of studies that you've seen out there that support um, the, how valuable, like the how increasing the intensity and training to failure for muscle growth. And so I remember I had read that and seen that. Mm -hmm. And so all it did was confirm my bias. Mm -hmm. I already had this bias of like, oh, it works so good. My body changed. And then you see these studies that come out that say like, oh, failure training will help boost your gains. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, I'm sold. This is how I'm training all the time. But that wasn't the 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 complete picture, and I didn't get the complete picture till I was older, and realized like, oh my God, I had been overtraining myself for so long, and that's why I'd been stuck at this plateau for so many years. And simply scaling back, and then going to a technique of two in the tank, actually catapulted my gains again when not doing that. And then now, when I failure train, it's really rare. It's maybe you know the occasional like maybe I've been training really consistently through one of our programs, and I'm like in maps anabolic or something. And I just want to see where my squat strength is or my deadlift mm -hmm. strength. Cause I haven't tested a PR out in a while. Max, yeah. yeah. And I'll, and I'll inter and I'll interrupt my training like that. Just to, on a, a, a day. I just feel good. Right. I've been consistently seeing this progress and I'm like, Oh, I'm getting stronger. I feel good. It's like, Ooh, let's get after it this day and let's train to failure in this workout coming up. But it's so rare now that I train that way because I find that I see more negative effects from me pushing to failure than I saw see the the positive bit benefits. I feel like most avid lifters or like athletes, especially, uh, fall into this trap of of you know really going for that failure uh, mentality when they go into the workouts. I mean, this is really why a lot of um, you know gym partners are like uh, you know your your gym buddy like you needed a you need a spotter at that point because you're, like, you're going to fail all the time and like this i got in that trap where i was always like i i needed a spotter for especially the big compound lifts because it was like i had to just exert as much effort as possible and really literally couldn't get the last rep up because that's how i thought um, you know, I was going to be successful with it. And it, you know, you, you, you hit a ceiling with that. Yes. You're going to get some great progress and gains, but, um, not only that, like you're just gonna put so much stress on the joints and, and it, at a certain inevitable point, you're going to set yourself back because of a, a, an injury or a hiccup. I'm convinced those are the guys that are leaving those comments too, that yeah. are still stuck in that phase. Cause that's what I would have thought about us when I was still stuck yeah. in that, that phase of training. Cause I thought like, Inten I was sold at that point in my career that like it, the importance of intensity, it, every workout needs to be that way. And that's the type of people yeah. I was listening to. And also, if you train consistently and then you go to failure, you see fast gains yeah. in a short period of time. Yeah. So you're sold. That happened to me as a kid. I, I first started working out 
high volume, you know, classic Arnold Schwarzenegger style workouts. Then a book, I well, it didn't come out, had come out before, but I had found a book called Heavy Duty, which was written by Mike Menser, is, and, and it was coached by Arthur Jones, the inventor of Nautilus Equipment. And he made the argument, he was, it was a very compelling argument, that the intensity is what turns on the muscle building switch, okay? And we don't know exactly what intensity is required. We know it's high intensity. So go to failure because you're for sure going to hit it if you fail. Right. And then he said, but, you know, it stresses the body, so let's cut the volume way down. And so he advocated for one set to failure. That's mm -hmm. it. Once a week, one set to failure per body part. Well, I went from 20 sets per body part to one set to failure, and I saw crazy gains in like five or six weeks. <laughs> right, right. And that was it. I was sold. Now, my body stopped responding after five or six weeks. Right. But of course, like a like a hard-headed you know, teenage kid, I just stuck to it. Maybe I'm not doing it hard enough. Yeah, and to exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly what happened. But if you utilize this properly in short periods of time, you do get very, very quick gains. Another value of trained to failure, if you never do it or you haven't in a long time, is we it, it gives you a good basis of judging your two reps left in the tank. I noticed this for myself. I almost never train to failure. Yeah. But then when I do, I'll do like a rep and I'll be like, oh my God, two more and I'm going to fail. And then I'll do this too and be like, oh, I think I have more. And then I'll keep going and be like, oh my God, it, it was so much further than I thought. But once I hit that, now I have a better gauge of the right intensity. It's a great point. And this is something I had to like remind myself of, especially for young lifters or people like coming up and really trying to figure out their gauge of what their, their capacity is. Like you have to be able to stretch a bit first so you know where that line is. Uh, you know, to be able to get maximize your potential. And so, yeah, it is, you have to kind of know where that line is in order to back off just a bit yeah. to, to keep progressing. I yeah. found it really valuable with my female clients. So it was, it was more common for me that when I had a male client, I had to pull weight off the bar and say, Hey, hey we're not ready for yeah. that. We don't need to do that yet. Let's work on technique. And it was uh, more common with my female clients where I'd like, I think you can do more. Like you look, you look really controlled and good there. Let's add more. And so getting my female clients to push to actual failure, not a lot of my female clients had done that before. And they saw huge change and gains yeah. from that where a lot of guys, I just think that it's a, it's a macho thing. Like it's you I'm by 17 going sure. in the gym. I was already like, yeah, you just you want know, to add more. Yeah, anyways. I already had a buddy spotting four reps in ego. the bench press. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I already was doing that because I wanted to show how much weight I could move right at that age where you know, women don't tend, they don't care about that as much. And they're, 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 they care more about taking care of themselves, not getting hurt. And so they kind of lean on, on the more cautious Plus, side. Plus there was the whole myth that, you know, lifting heavy would make you right. bulky. That's right. right? So they're yeah. afraid. Right? Totally. So there's a combination of both those things going on. So I saw great results of getting my female clients to actually push them and encourage them to like, Hey, let's try and do some singles or doubles. Like you've never pushed your body before or have seen like how much can you really do? Like, have you ever tried to squat and then actually failed at it? Like not a lot of my female clients could say, yes, they had done that before. And so getting them to do that, it would really catapult their results. Now the next one are, is called partial reps. Now, partial reps are just like they sound. You do your traditional full range of motion then you get to the point where you know you're not going to be able to do another full range of motion rep. So then you do like a partial rep, either a quarter rep or a half rep to be able to continue to stress the muscle. So to give an example, it would be like if I did a, a bench press and I had, you know, let's say 200 pounds in the bar and I did 10 reps and the 10th rep was a struggle. And I'm like, there's no way I could do another rep. Well, then what I would do is maybe three or four of these little short reps just to squeeze out more. This is a very advanced, high-intensity technique. And used sparingly, it does tend to lead to some pretty crazy gains. Be careful with this one because people Oof. tend to overestimate their ability with partial reps, yeah. thinking, oh, I'll just do a half squat next, uh, and I should be able to do five more reps. No, it's usually like two more. <laughs> or maybe one more of these. Well, these it fatigues the shit out of the muscle. Yeah. Yes. This, so this technique I like to use in like a hypertrophy block, right? So if I were in a hypertrophy phase and the mindset is now kind of chasing the pump, I'm mm -hmm. not really concerned about how heavy of weight I'm moving. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get as much of a pump as I can. 
uh, that's when I like to do things like a partial rep like that, where I don't really care. I'm not trying to get so much stronger per se in that block. I'm trying just to pump as much blood and fluid into the muscle. And I think that partial reps do an incredible job of that. Now, would you count, um, like, so say powerlifters have like a technique where they work on certain sticking points, uh, in, in the, the rep, would you count that as a partial? Rep what or? a great question. It, technically it is a partial rep, but not yeah. this technique. Not right that here. technique. Yeah. yeah. Well, powerlifters, I'm so glad you asked that. I didn't even think of that. What powerlifters are doing is something totally different. They're trying to train a particular portion of a rep that may be a sticking point, like let's say the bottom part of a squat or lockout in a mm -hmm. bench press. This is not that. This is literally, I can't do another full rep. Yeah. So, so I'm going to do- add in for more volume. It's for more volume yeah. and higher intensity. You know, there was a book that came out in the, I want to say early to mid nineties called Positions of Flexion. I think it was called. Uh, um, Paul DeMeo was on the covers, a, a now since deceased bodybuilder. And the argument in the book was that you don't need to do full reps it's all about the load. And since you could load the weight much more with a partial rep, let's just load as much as possible, do partial reps, and that's going to lead to all this muscle growth. It doesn't work that way. Uh, full range of motion reps are superior even when the weight is lighter than partial reps. So this is not an excuse to lift more, do partial reps, because now you're lifting more weight, therefore I'm going to get better results. No. It, it is good that Justin brought that up, though, because they both are different techniques. Totally. But, but are similar, right? Because you are doing a partial rep similar, in both yeah. cases. Yes. But one of them, you are loading close to a max load and trying to move the weight, where the other one, you're probably using a weight that you're working out with, and then you're just like- Trying to get you're more reps out of it. Yeah, getting more reps It's not out. even a sticking point. It's it's more like you're what you're doing is you're- So power lifters will typically do a partial rep with the hardest part of the rep. Yes. Yeah. The way right. this is used- And they'll load it. And it won't yeah. be like a pumping extra, like a bunch no. of reps. It's like trying to get it out of that. Yes. No, this is more like, I can't do any more reps. Let me do partials with the easiest part because that's what I can do. Yeah. Right? So like if the bottom of a squat is the hardest, your partial rep at the end of your set is not going to be at the bottom. It's going to be a quarter squat at the top because you're just trying to squeeze out more reps yes. and more intensity. Um, this one, again, is super intense and this is beyond failure. So typically it's like, I fail, now let me squeeze out- a few partial reps. Again, mm -hmm. using it sparingly, it's got some pretty cool uh, benefit. The next one is called rest pause, which is really interesting. This is an interesting one. I didn't learn until much later. Rest pause is like this. So let's say you're doing your, your, your rows and it, you do your set of rows and then you typically rest two minutes before you do another set. That's a standard, you know, amount of rest period in between sets or whatever. Well, rest pause is I do X amount of reps and then I put the weight down and rest like 15 seconds and then try and squeeze one or two more reps out. That's a rest pause. Mm -hmm. It's literally another way to squeeze out one or two more repetitions past failure. So originally when you put this on there, I wasn't sure where you were going with rest pause. And I, if I would have known that, I, I actually would have put cluster sets right next to that because that's a very similar technique. Yes, it is. Right? Cluster sets are a form of rest pause. It is. Yes. So the, those are, it's basically the same thing. It's just a, a, its own protocol of how many reps that you're, you're doing is, which is you're basically only giving yourself four second rest between those reps. Right? Yes. So you yes, have a, yes. you do a couple of reps, then you set the bar down for literally one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, boom, pick it back up. Yep. Do it again. Mm -hmm. What you'll find is you'll take a weight, right? What's really fascinating with cluster sets is let's say just hypothetically that a 80 pound curl bar, right? Is, is heavy for me to do say 12 reps. Well, straight 12 reps, right? Just regular mm -hmm. 12 reps with an 80. That would be hard. Uh, I could doing cluster sets. I could probably get 25 to 30 reps of that because like every every fourth rep I set it down give myself four yeah. seconds then I pick it back up do four more because those little bit of those short rest pauses that I get right there is enough to give me a little bit more juice mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden a set that I can normally only get about 12 reps now becomes I get like 20 plus reps out of that so you get these incredible pumps you're able to lift heavier weight for more reps it's a great technique uh, to, I think, interrupt like your rate, re regular training. And this is kind of where I use it. So same place that you would probably use these rest pause type of training, I would use cluster yeah, sets I would also. do, I do cluster sets now once every couple months. Just to give people an example of how seldomly I use it. And it's only when I feel really good mm. and I'm really rested and I'm feeling strong and I'm feeling healthy. And uh, then I'll throw one in. And I usually don't do a rest pause or cluster set for a big gross motor movement. It just fries me. I, I I don't typically do this with a. It's a great arm or shoulder. The, yeah, yeah like isolation all the time. Great yeah. arm, shoulder, calves. laterals, curls, calf raises, that yeah. kind of stuff, is how I typically uh, will use it. All right, this next one 
it is an advanced technique, although you could practice and play with this a little bit um, if you're not advanced. I, now, I, I will warn you, um, it is advanced because uh, it can cause some issues with muscle recruitment patterns. It can cause some issues with technique and form because uh, of its effect on the central nervous system. So this next one is intraset stretching. So what is an intraset stretch? Well, it would be when I do uh, a set of an exercise and I go really, really hard right after I'm done with the set, I get into like a weighted uh, stretch of that muscle. This is very painful. This does not feel like your typical stretch that, well, it's kind of relieving or it hurts a little bit. This is nasty. So it's like if I did flies or let's say I did bench press and I went to failure, racked it up. Then I grab a pair of dumbbells and I sit in this kind of stretched position for 30 right. seconds. In range sort of isometric pose yes. at that point. Yeah. Yes. And the fire you feel from this sucks. It's really one of the most painful things you'll feel. Now, what do you get from it? Crazy pumps. I have never felt a pump. Uh, well, I don't want to say never. There's other techniques like BFR that'll do it, but this gives you the nastiest pump when you hold a stretch right after uh, a hard set. I think I just saw you do that about a yeah. couple of weeks ago. Yes. I think you were doing that over here. I was, I was, didn't we do uh, a series with Ben Pakulski we did. where mm -hmm. we we did this on the YouTube? Yeah, he's big on them. Yeah, make sure that yeah. Andrew throws that video up so now, it, people can he, see, see what it looks like. Now, this, was, this was new to me. I, I had never messed with this. Oh, until, really? Yeah, yeah, until way Even later. with calves? Yeah. Wow, wow. Oh, yeah. Because calves, people tend to do it with calves without realizing yeah, it. Yeah, maybe know. unintentionally yeah. I was doing it on a seated calf machine, mm -hmm. but not really thinking thinking about it though like that. So that's mm -hmm. a good point. Like, not that I had never done it intentionally like I, like I did after we had met with uh, Ben and talked about it. So yeah. that was oh, when I started it's, doing it's it. It's gnarly. It hurts really bad. And here's the stuff the, that you want to watch out for. A, a, a stretch, a, a long-held stretch, tends to get the CNS to relax in that muscle. So if you're trying to like max load your lift or you're trying to hit like a PR in squats, you probably don't want to do this. This is more of a bodybuilding thing, right? I don't want to hold a quad stretch really long after a set of squats if I'm trying to go for a PR on my next set. Yeah. It's all about feel. It's all about the pump. The last thing you want to do is hold a long stretch before doing a max lift. It right. just turns things off and it can make things uh, a little precarious, which is why you know this is in the kind of advanced uh, category. Mm -hmm. All right, this next one, this one's a lot of fun, uh, which is why people do it all the time, but it is <laughs> advanced, uh, and it's a drop set. And a drop set literally is, I do X amount of reps with the weight, put the weights down, and grab 10 pound lighter yeah. or five pound lighter, do more reps, can't do any more. Put those down. Grab another one that's five or ten pound lighter, and you you know some people call it running Run, the rack. Running the rack, right? Yeah. yeah, I love doing that with especially for arms, like any kind of shoulders or biceps, and um, yeah, taking it from heavy and working your way down, and you know it's one of those you don't want to repeat too many times. That's for sure because it's it's pretty demanding uh and it fries you but uh it's great one to interrupt you know your regular training sessions well this is a, this is another one that would fall in the category of for me when i'm i'm training for hypertrophy i just it lends itself well and so instead of doing like four sets of shoulder raises you're you, gonna go you kind of get one, it all done at once that's right run. yeah so it's kind of like and also good for limited time right so it's like okay and, you know, maybe because we're talking about this right now, I talked about how I might, maybe I'll do today because I have 20, 30 minutes to work out. I'll do, you know, one try set and then one run the rack or one, yeah. you know, drop set of something like that. And now I have got a pretty good workout in a short period of time and, and super effective. But that to me, that's how I, I think it lends itself really well when you're chasing a pump. It's not the best thing for building lots of strength. Doesn't mean it can't build strength because if you never do it and then you do it, you might see strength gains yeah. from it. But I think it lends itself well in a, a hypertrophy type of phase where you're already doing higher reps and kind of chasing the pump. This is where I would try to intermittently throw that into the routine. Yes, and I like drop sets more for isolation exercises than compound. Not saying you can't do them with compound lifts, but if you do a compound lift drop set, you better have some spotters. I learned this the hard way. I, I remember as a kid, oh, yeah. <laughs> as when I left the YMCA the first time and signed up at 24 Hour Fitness uh, when I was a kid, I did a drop set with bench press. And I had a bunch of small plates on the sides of the bar so I could do as many as I could and then push one off, push one off, do more, <laughs> push one off, push one off. Well, you fatigue really fast and I didn't have collars on the bar because I was pushing the weights off. So what happens is, you know, you I started losing saw. stability. <laughs> oh yeah. And I, I, I actually I broke the window. I so actually think this is the single best usage of the Smith machine. We, we, I mean, I know in older podcasts, what a great point. we've yeah. talked about the Smith machine being like one of the more useless machines. And I know that caused a lot of controversy back then. 
Um, and because we used to say like how much better free weights was, and I still believe that, but here's a great example of where I think that's a great tool because I'm, if I'm by myself, I can do a drop set on a bench press. I can do a drop set on, about losing the bar. on a barbell press yeah. and you can do it quick, right? Cause it's, mm -hmm. you rack it real quick and you roll your wrist and then you can slide off, slide off, and then you're right back into it again. And so I think uh, it lends itself very, very well for that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and in a situation like that, I am chasing more of a pump. I, let, I, I know that a standing barbell press is more beneficial overall for me, strength and functionality. But hey, I'm in a, a hypertrophy phase. I'm looking for a pump. I want to do drop sets today. Here's where I would it, use the Smith machine. You would find me using Yeah, it. that's a good point. Drop sets are great with dumbbells because they're easy to put down and machines. Machines are great because I can literally take the pin and put it lighter, put it lighter, put it lighter each time. Now, you know what I used to do with drop sets? This was actually a lot of fun. Not very uh, valuable in terms of gains, but just fun. When I'd work out with one of my buddies or my cousin, we would do this with curls. So we'd take a weight, and I would do eight reps. I'd hand it to him. He did eight reps, and I'd grab a lighter one. And, <laughs> yeah. and we'd go back and forth, back and forth, until we would you know, be down to like 10 pounds, and well, we'd make fun of each other. Great for partner workouts. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And this is, of course, you got a 10-pound, you know, you're trying to curl 10 pounds at the very end. That's exactly when the attractive girl would walk in, yeah. and you try and tell her, no, no, no I can curl <laughs> yeah. more. No, that's you. <laughs> you know, 99, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so this next one is really interesting because this one got invented out of necessity. It's, it's super slow motion training and this became a thing in gyms in the u.s during world war ii now of course gyms were not very commercial back in those days but there were gyms but they would ration iron uh because of the war effort and so it was hard to get or almost impossible to get big heavy weights so what did the strength athletes do they said well like if i only have you know 50 pounds here what if i do the rep really slow so instead of you know two or three seconds up and down i'll do 30 seconds up and 30 seconds down. Well, it turns out it actually has got some value. If you've never done this before, try a super slow motion uh, exercise and uh, it'll definitely, it can definitely set things in motion. Again. That's the cool part about the weight training. There's a lot of variables you can apply that will make things harder. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is definitely one of those uh, where if, if you're just concerned about the tempo, now if we slow everything down and you have to control the weight and you're still struggling, but for a longer period of time. So you have that kind of uh, muscle tension that's just firing uh, throughout the entire rep. It's going to be pretty challenging. This is my favorite to use. It's my favorite to teach. It's also the one of all of these, I would say, that I would even still recommend to a beginner. Even yeah. though we put this Very as a, safe. Good definitely point. the safer one. Even always. though we put this as advanced techniques, and it is because there's other you know basics and fundamentals that even a beginner should be doing before they even need to do this. But I find this as a great tool, even for beginners, as a great way to increase intensity Density without loading the bar more. It's like, and if anything, super slow motion. Teaches them control. Safer. That's right. Not to mention, I still think, and I, I've said this on the podcast many times, that if you walk into a commercial gym, I challenge you to find me more than one person in the entire gym doing a, a true controlled four second eccentric motion, which is basic protocol for hypertrophy. That's not even super slow mode. That's not even super slow mode. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's such a great tool to teach people because I already think that even some of the most advanced lifters do not utilize a four second eccentric motion on most most exercises so getting a client comfortable with a 10 second eccentric is and and getting to know that hey this is a way we can train we can really mm -hmm. slow it down and get great strength gains and build lots of muscle from training with this lighter weight and increasing the intensity through slowing down the repetition and it's super safe because yes. i'm moving a light weight yeah in my experience the the tempo you want that's most effective with super slow-mo is about 10 to 15 seconds of negative and positive. So that means it would take 10 seconds or 15 seconds to go down, 10 or 50 seconds on the way up. However, super slow motion training will can call for as much as 30 seconds up and down. Now, in my experience, when you go that long, it's turned now into an endurance exercise and much less uh, of a strain. It's just too long of a rep. So one minute to do one rep, it tends to- turn You know, there's a long. whole uh, chain of gyms that are catered to the advanced age that mm -hmm. it's, and it's, I think it's called super slow, slow motion. Yeah. I oh, think wow. it's called, yeah, I think it's called super slow. It's a, it's a gym chain. Uh, it's fairly popular or it was, I don't know if it still is around that much, but, and it caters to the advanced age and that's, and it's all that mm -hmm. it's like basically strength training. And I think, and again, I think it's a, a great 
tool for even beginners because it doesn't have high risk because you're moving a lot lower of a load. And again, I think more people can slow down. And as a, as a coach and a trainer, it gives you that opportunity to kind of critique, critique the movement while mm -hmm. they're in that. Oh, each little piece, right? Uh -huh, Absolutely. Uh -huh. All right, this next one's kind of cool because uh, I messed with this as a kid, not really knowing what it was, but rather because I would just copy the bodybuilders that I would read about. And these are isometric holds. There's a couple ways to do this, and they're always at the end of a set. So you do your set. It's real intense. You're done. There's two ways to do this. One is to simply flex the target muscle as hard as you can mm -hmm. at the end of the set. Mm -hmm. So I just finished doing curls. I put the bar down. I flex my biceps as hard as I can, and I hold that for 10 or 15 seconds. And now the, the intensity of the squeeze is important when you're doing this without resistance. The second way that people will do this uses resistance where at the end of a set, for example, uh, at the end of a uh, bench press, when it's my last rep, I just hold it at the top and stabilize it and squeeze my muscles. So mm -hmm. now I'm using ex, you know, uh, resistance outside of my body, not intrinsic. Personally, I prefer the intrinsic version because the other version of the risk factor is much higher, but they're both pretty valuable. Well, this is actually almost the same as your uh, interest at stretching. Right. You're just mm -hmm. focused on the other Correct. portion of, of the squeeze. The, the, right? Yeah. This is the squeeze instead of the stretch, but the same concept is what's happening, right? As I think we're just, you're, you're trying to recruit more neurons to that area in that moment of where that muscle is at, right? So mm -hmm. is it the elongated position or is it in the fully contracted, fully position? contracted would be this one, right? That's yeah, the yeah. squeeze, right? And the, this one's, this one, even the posing can be pretty gnarly. If you know how to pose properly, you do a set and then squeeze the shit out of a muscle. Oh, it's so nice I've thing. done some of in, in too. Bruce Lee was big uh, about this too. It's like doing bench and then going into like a chest squeeze and a fly with he's uh -huh. holding it and contracting. Um, and uh, it, in terms of like holding like kind of like an interest set one where I'm, I'm doing a bench, but then I'm also holding at the bottom of depth and I'm like holding it for an extra long amount of time and then pressing my way out too. I love doing that. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. All right, the next one. This one's kind of cool. Um, this is a more of, and now it's not going to sound high intensity because you don't go to failure with this, but believe me, it is. This is 10 by 10, it's called. So what do you do with this? You pick an, an exercise. Usually it's a compound lift. And the goal is to do 10 sets of 10 reps of that exercise. And the goal is to use the same weight the whole time. Okay. So why is this so hard? Because you use what you, well, you, what you'll find when you do this is that you need way less weight than you think. Believe it. Uh, when you get to the fifth or sixth set, those 10 reps. I'm man, always, I'm nervous. always off on this one. I mean, this is GVT right here. Yeah. So I, I think that, that it's, in, it's awesome, but <laughs> every time I do it, I am always miscalculate. I, right? I totally miscalculate. I think like, oh, okay. Yeah. Wait. I work out with like two twenty five on the bench for like a normal four set type of thing. So yeah, I'll drop it down to one eighty five. Mm. You know, that'll, that'll be fine. It's like I'm doing like one fifteen by the yeah. end of it because I had no idea like how much I totally yeah. under underestimated how hard. Uh, now it would the be. Bulgarians you know? used to do versions of this uh, with weightlifting. Obviously, it's German volume training, so the Germans would do this as well. East Germans. This is all during the time of the Soviet Union. Now their protocol, protocol Sal, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're only doing like one muscle group in the workout, right? Like that's it's a one exercise. Now yeah. remember, it, it came from Olympic lifts and strength athletes. So they didn't even think about muscles. They would just do squats or presses or, uh, you know, overhead squat or something like that. And it's basically practicing the lift over and over again. So now you should, at the end of this 10 set extra workout, you should be able to perform all 10 reps. But don't let that fool you. It is gnarly. Doing yeah. 10 sets of 10 of any exercise is so much volume of one movement mm -hmm. that it re it's an advanced technique because it fries the shit out of you. What's some of the value of it, though, is your CNS uh, adaptation is amazing because it's the same exercise for 10 sets. So you get really – whatever exercise you practice when you do this, if you do it right, you get really, really good – at that lift, and it's a yeah. great way to boost strength. So I made the mistake of, for many years, of doing this as my first day back always. So <laughs> oh, wow. yeah, I know it's not that yeah. sounds really obvious and stupid now, right? Well, because the, the way we talk about things, but. My, my thought process was uh, this, like, so I would be the first day back. Let's say I'd been like a month off of training with that. And I'm getting back to it. And I would go do squats. And so what I thought was like, I knew I was really, really weak because I hadn't done it. So I had to do a super lightweight. So I just do 10 reps to 10. 
How are 10 sets yeah. of 10? I would just, I put a really light weight on them. It was normally 135. That's what I would do. And I just do 10 reps and I could, I could do that and then I'd re rack it away. But boy, it was, I was sore. so sore. Yeah. Just way too much volume. It was mm -hmm. just way too much. And that's why this is a, even though you're moving a lot lighter weight, it's a, t a tremendous amount of volume for a muscle group one, to handle. One movement pattern. Yes. Over and over and over. Yeah. Again. So this is definitely advanced. You want to have been lifting for a while before you do it. And then the l way I love to use it now is, is I might do like a week where I interrupt my training and do exactly kind of what you said. One one movement. I'll do squats on one day, then I'll do like overhead press, yes. and then I'll do deadlift, and then I'll do like a bench press. And that is my workout. It's like 10 sets of 10, and I'll do a week of training like that, and I find I feel amazing. And it's a great interruption of like your normal training. It's like, when do you ever go to the gym and just do one exercise for the entire time, and then that's all you do, and then you're I, out of there. And the, the mm -hmm. worst I... One of the worst times I ever felt after a workout where I knew like, oh, I, I way overdid it. And it actually took me a few weeks just to recover from this one particular workout was I did 10 by 10 with deadlifts. And the weight I chose, now this is back when I was real heavy into deadlifting. So I, I could probably max out pull at the time, 575, 585. So I'm like 315. At the time was easy for me. I could do 10 reps, no problem. It's not really that hard. So let me do 10 by 10 with 315. I was fr I couldn't deadlift properly for three weeks afterwards. Yeah. It fried my body so much. So I, I'm communicating that because it's a lot harder than it may even seem yeah. in the workout itself because it's the same thing. It's the same movement pattern over and over again. It just really fries the body. All right, this last one for me is the one that not only did I abuse the most when I was a kid, but it's also the one that I don't, I almost never do now. Yeah. I almost never do this one now. But when I was a kid, I did it almost all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's forced reps. What's the four strap? Well, it's when you lift a weight, you go to failure, and then your friend helps you do two or three or four. That's what I used to do. Four four straps at the end of every single set. <laughs> now, why do I never do this anymore? Because I work out. I work out alone. I can't do a four strap by myself. I have to have. Not it only that, but I even think that it, I, I'm with you. I don't ever do this anymore. Um, because well, even if you have somebody spotting you, if you if you if you really pay attention to your form. It's really tough once you've completely fatigued a muscle and gone to failure. It's like hard that. to not go to shit, isn't it? It's not, it's yeah. so hard. You're you're gonna. This is when you're gonna see what side's a little bit stronger than the <laughs> yeah. other because the one that has a a fraction of energy or strength left will try to take over the load, yeah. and then you just create a bad recruitment pattern. It's like here you got this great bit, and then I'm out, and it's like oh my left has got a little bit more gas, and then you feel that you'll feel that yeah. shoulder come off or that arm start to lead, and the bar comes. So I. I just I think force reps are incredibly overrated. You can train to failure without it. Yeah. You can increase intensity by so many different ways of manipulating. We are just listed off 10 different advanced techniques that you can incorporate into your training. I'm glad you left this as the, like the last one because <laughs> it is the one of all of these that I can't even tell you the last time that I, I utilized. Uh, yeah, I just remember doing this with like one of my friends and it was to the point where you, you couldn't do the rep. They're literally like helping you through the majority of, of that rep. The following like two days after that was the source I've ever been. It was <laughs> almost like I was completely worthless at that point. So it's like if you if you want to look at that in terms of like your progress into the leading into the next workouts, it's you know, like you got to be really judicious about how you apply this. Yeah. And you know, the biggest point I think is the one that Adam made, which is when you're doing a forced rep. The goal with the first off the workout partner is to make the rep hard for you. Your goal is to continue to move the bar or the dumbbell or the weight or whatever. It's so easy for your form to go out the window. So if you do do force reps, yes, push the weight, but do not compromise your form. So it's not get the reps out at all costs. No. It's get the reps out good. Meaning if I'm doing a bench press and I'm and my and my friend is doing a force rep, so they're whole, they're helping me just enough to help me move it. And I notice, uh-oh, I'm starting to turn one side fix it and push a little less hard. So I, the way I, okay. And that's hard to do. I used to do it all the time. Yeah. And the way I would coach this is I, I used to have to coach the trainers that were, that were spotting me for this. And I would say, don't let me break my tempo. So if I'm doing, let's say eight reps, right. And I know, or I'm going to do 10 reps and I know eight, I can get on my own, but the last two are probably going to be forced. Yeah. I tell them that pay attention. I want your fingers under the bar at, at one. So you can ride me and feel the tempo that I'm moving the bar and I never want to break tempo. 
So you need to be able to spot me to where I still move the bar at that tempo. That way I don't do that because where everybody goes wrong with this and where spotters are, are, it's tough to spot is they wait until the guy hits failure and he's already uh, struggling with the weight. And then they get in there and they try and pull and help out. And then you get this, (laughs) you know, left to right bullshit going on. And then it's just, that's terrible. So like you want to be able to keep that, that nice tempo, but then you're also trying to squeeze out two, three or four more reps that you're technically not doing. Yeah. That's a good point. Like the the reason why I made this one last is because it also requires a good spotter, a a good spotter, somebody who knows, how to make sure your form is good and knows the right tempo and, and how to help. Because usually what they do is exactly what you said. They'll leave the bar on you. Until yeah, you, wait till you, you can do it. You can you come, do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> like, bro, make it move. I can't. Yeah. 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 Or I'm lifting all the weight for you. Okay, that's the point, bro. Like, let's, let's do this right. Anyway, there you have it. Uh, 10 advanced training techniques that can spark new growth, new strength, and new progress. Look, if you like our content, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. You can find Adam on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. How do I incorporate cardio and not lose muscle? I've seen people do this before where they'll start to lose the sharpness of their muscles or they'll start to lose the sculpt a little bit. And that's disheartening. But if you do it right, then you minimize that muscle loss or that metabolism slowdown. In fact, if you do it right, you can actually speed up your metabolism at the same time that you build stamina and endurance. You just have to be able to kind of program it properly. And the way to program it improperly is just to go do as much cardio as you can for as long as you can. Right.